we are live now okay so can you see the participants yeah yes okay wonderful okay before i speak ritu i'm sharing a message from uh, so you just work on it ha huh? um, Okay. Uh, so good evening and good afternoon and good morning to all. We have from three zones right now. On behalf of the Indian Phage Society. SBRT, which is Society for Bacteriophage Research and Therapy, I and my colleague Dr. Taruna Anand extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speakers, Dr. Toby Nagel and Dr. Janet Nee. We also welcome all the participants for joining in, and we look forward to your active participation. Before we start, I have to share this information. I'm very, I'm very saddened to inform. Here that unfortunately Professor Martha Kloki is not able to join us today due to sad demise of her father, and um, so we are. It's just a very sad news, and uh, we regret that she can't join. But we understand. So our deep condolences are with her and her family in this very hour of grief. Um, so we will start. So uh, Dr. Toby Nagel is the founder and head of Pages of Pages for Global Health, which is a U.S.-based NGO. And Dr. Janet Nail is a research associate at the University of Leicester, U.K. So they will be sharing with us their experience about conducting training workshops in phage technology, through which they are contributing to the scientific capacity building in several countries. Rather. Different continents, and their belief is that the infectious rates are higher in these countries, like in Africa and Asia. But the expertise on phages is, is missing there. So through their uh, workshops, they are trying to uh, impart the skill sets for phage research in the these countries. Thank you very much, Dr. Toby and Dr. Janet, for joining us and taking your time out. Um, May I please request now the president of the Fate Society in India, Dr. Professor Sanjay Chipper, if he can kindly introduce both the speakers. Professor Sanjay, are you here? Is he here? Uh, he is not here, ma'am. Dr. Kapal, can you call him? Anybody can call him. Uh, or did he lose his connection? Ramesh, can you call him? He is coming. That room. Me. Within a second, he will be joining. So we'll have to wait for a minute, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so he's he's joining. His audio is connecting. So, uh, Professor Chipper, I just introduced uh, the what is the topic of the day. Uh, what are we going to uh, uh, the, about the speakers? 
and I now request uh, you to kindly introduce both the speakers to our audience. Uh, Professor Sanjay Shipper, can you hear me? You have to unmute, unmute. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, please. Yeah. yeah. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. I have the pleasure to introduce today's speakers for this webinar, which is being organized by the Society for Bacteriophage Research and Therapy. Uh, we have got two speakers today. They are Toby Nogel and Dr. Jared Nail. And I'll be introducing them one by one. First of all, I am introducing Dr. Toby Nagel, is founder and president of Phages for Global Health. Prior to uh, founding Phages for Global Health, Toby spent 15 years in the pharmaceutical industry, co-developing drugs that have been tested in more than 80 clinical trials. She was a Moonshot Fellow of the Keris Lab for Social Impact, a Fulbright Specialist Roaster member and an advisor to Farges for Human Applications Group Europe. She is currently an editorial board member of the scientific journal Farge Therapy Application and Research and an advisory board member for both the Farge Biotics Research Foundation and Farge Pro, a company developing cholera Farges. Toby did a postdoctoral fellowship at the American Hospital in Turkey and completed a PhD in medical engineering at the Harvard MIT Division of Health Science and Technology and a BS in, chemi BS in Chemical Engineering at Stanford University. So with this introduction, I now move to the other speaker that is Dr. Janet Nail. Janet has over a decade's experience in developing robust pathways to isolate, characterize and apply phages as alternative therapeutics and as adjuncts to antibiotics to control pathogenic bacteria. She has extensively worked on preclinical research investigating phages of nosocomial Clostridium difficile, animal Salmonella species, and environmental Pseudomonas species. She has developed novel cocktails and regimes to effectively eliminate bacteria in biofilms, wax moth larvae, and in human batch fermentation infection models. Janet holds an American uh, associate fellow status of the UK Higher Education Academy, completed a PhD in MRIS in microbiology, MSc in plant pathology, and BSc in botany. She currently works at University of Leicester as a postdoctoral researcher. So with this introduction of our today's speakers, I hand over it to Dr. Urmi. Thank you, Professor Chipper, for your kind introduction to both the speakers. So uh, I would like to tell the audience that now we will start with the presentation. And uh, to, uh, Dr. Toby, you can uh, mention if you're expecting any other guest. Uh, the presentation will be followed by question and answer sessions. So you all are welcome to post your questions and we will take them once the presentation is over. And I thank once again, Professor Chibber, Dr. Lok Tobi, and Dr. Janet for being here. We have been looking forward to this uh, webinar for a long time, and I'm so glad that finally it has happened. And as Toby rightly mentioned, that we are uh, on the eve of our Independence Day, and thank you all for coming and spending your Friday evening with us. And it speaks volumes about how excited everybody is to have you both as speakers. So without much ado, I welcome you both, and please start the presentation. Well, thank you all for those introductions, and we're pleased to be here and meet you, and we hope to interact a fair bit during the discussion period after our presentation. Um, I'll, on behalf of both Janet and myself, we're quite pleased um, to be invited here and to interact with you. And I know that Martha really wanted to be here, too, so we bring her greetings and we send her condolences. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'll give the first first part of this presentation, and then Janet will jump in, and then I will come back. Ermi, can you see my screen okay now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I can see. It's good. Yeah. So, um, the motivation for our work, as Ermi mentioned 
it comes from this slide and the data shown here was published in 2014. Um, can you see my, my cursor also if I point to things? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay, good. So this was published in 2019, this study um, led by a team in the UK led by Jim O'Neill. And it predicts the number of deaths that are expected around the world from annually due to antimicrobial resistance by the year 2050. And as you can see, um, I'm gonna stop here for a second because I'm hearing a little bit of feedback and I'm gonna put on my headset hoping that minimizes it. I don't know if everybody else hears that. Yeah, there's a bit of echo. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, this is lovely. Okay, okay. So what's predicted is um, between 300 and 400,000 deaths per year in Europe, each North America and Latin America and even less down under. But as most of you probably know, over 400, almost 500 million deaths per year in Africa and Asia respectively. And so what that says is that, <clears throat> excuse me, roughly 90% of the deaths from antimicrobial resistance are expected to occur in Africa and Asia. So of course that includes India. Um, yet the majority of the phage experts, not all, but the majority are in Europe and North America. And I would, I would say, um, I do think there's a number of experts in both India and China, so that's not, this is a generalization. Nonetheless, it's really this disconnect between where AMR deaths, the majority of the AMR deaths will occur and where most of the phage experts are that motivated me to found phages for global health. Um, officially in 2016, though we started our work a year or two before that. And this is our mission to we're a nonprofit organization that facilitates the application of phage technology, specifically in developing countries in Africa and Asia. And we do this through two major programs. <clears throat> the first we'll be talking about today, the laboratory training workshops, which are short, it's a short-term regional training program we do throughout Africa and Asia. And then we also have several development projects, product development projects ongoing, where we bring together international teams of phage experts from wherever they might happen to be, often in Europe or the US, and infectious disease specialists in Africa and Asia to co-develop phage products, um, because I think the expertise of both is needed to make really effective products. So today we're focusing just on the laboratory training program or the workshops and the overall strategy of this is that it's a two week hands on laboratory training workshop through which the participants learn how to isolate and characterize phages from their local sources. Um, and we bring in science from across scientists from across a given region so East Africa or West Africa so far and, and we're about to expand into Southeast Asia. And we provide all the lab supplies, flights, hotels, meals, etc. <clears throat> and so we've run four workshops thus far. The first was in Uganda in 2017, then Kenya, Ghana, and this past January, just, just before the corona or as the coronavirus pandemic was starting, we ran a workshop in Tanzania. And we were planning to run one in Malaysia in November, but we are postponing that until it's safe and allowed to travel internationally again. So let me give you a, a snapshot of how one of these workshops works. So for example, the most recent one in Tanzania, we had 25 participants who were selected through a competitive application process. They came from four countries, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda, and they represented 14 different institutions. So according to the math there, you can see that there were roughly two people per institution. We don't require that, but, but if it works out that way, we're pleased because that way the people could go back to their home institutions with a partner who can help them spread knowledge about phage biology at their local institution. And I wanna emphasize that we include people in these workshops from all levels of their 
career, um, both junior people and senior people. And the reason for this is that we think all levels are needed if phage therapy is going to progress in any given country. We need people who are working day in and day out in the lab, isolating and characterizing phages. And we need more senior people who are in positions to decide how um, financial resources and other resources will be given to phages. So that's why we actively include people from all levels. For this particular training, we had funding from several sources. One is the Conservation Food and Health Foundation, which is a private foundation in the US. They've actually funded three of our workshops. And then two other organizations in the UK, the Microbiology Society and the Company of Biologists. They also have each funded at least two or three of our workshops. But let me emphasize that much of our work is, is funded through crowdfunding. And so we had over 60 individual donors who felt this was important and, and donated to help us do this, which is a really exciting piece of what we do. Our instructional staff um, was a little bit larger in Tanzania than we've had before. We started these workshops with Martha, Janet, Ben Chan from Yale University and myself. And then in Tanzania, we were able to add Dr. Shana McKaylin from Switzerland to our team. And in the last three workshops, we've actually, we've been able to bring different teaching assistants. Um, Slavo Mayer or Slav came with us to Tanzania from the University of Warwick. He's a PhD student. And we've found it's great to have a teaching assistant with us. They provide an extra set of hands. In this case, Slav has uh, real expertise in bioinformatics that he could add to the teaching. Um, so that's been great. And let me highlight that the idea for these workshops really came from Ben Chan when he and I had a discussion probably in 2015 or 2016. And he said, you know, we could just go to a country and teach people how to isolate phages. And then eventually this idea evolved and I was able to raise the funding. So that's our staff at the moment. But um, it's really important. In fact, these workshops would not happen if we did not have in-country co-organizers. So for the Tanzania workshop, we had Drs. Niambura Moremi and Doreen Donald Komori. Niambura Moremi was a participant in our very first workshop in 2017 in Uganda. She came there from Tanzania. She's been the director of the National Health Laboratory in Tanzania, which um, doesn't really have teaching laboratories. And as you'll see from some of the photos, we really need large teaching spaces to run these workshops. So she recruited Doreen from Muhumbili University of Health and Allied Sciences, which had a great teaching facility. And together they helped to uh, facilitate so many of the logistics that are required on site to run one of these workshops. So with that, I think I will turn it over to um, Janet, let me unshare my screen here. And Janet can now talk about the topics that are taught during these workshops. Just one moment, please. Okay. All right, so um, thank you, Toby, and everyone for organizing the um, webinar and also for joining in. So I'll just continue from where uh, Toby stopped and mainly focusing on how the workshop actually run. And as uh, Toby already mentioned, uh, initially we started with uh, three of us. Uh, this is Matt up here giving a lecture and then myself here helping with the uh, practicals and also Ben here as well helping during the practical class. So the workshop actually um, just was split into two. Uh, we had the morning section as well as the afternoon section. So the morning section focuses on lectures and these entails uh, mainly theoretical aspects of facial research, which I'm going to talk about some of the topics that we covered during the morning lectures. 
So we, we have breaks and then in the afternoon we come back and carry on with laboratory work. Uh, so this is uh, where the participants will have the opportunity to be more hands-on and there'll be demonstrations from the, um, uh, the faculty lecturers, uh, myself, Martha and Ben, and then the, the participants will have the opportunity to actually practice or um, carry on with the practical uh, demonstration. So we have practical manuals already prepared, uh, which we strictly followed for the laboratory work. So for the lectures, we covered various topics. Uh, one is phage ecology, because it's important for the participants to understand how phages interact with the environment. And also that will guide their uh, selection of environment where they can actually target to isolate these phages from. And then we also did phage molecular biology, where the participants had the opportunity to isolate DNA and carry on also with PCR amplification of some genes. We did um, phage applications in agriculture where the participants learn how to apply phages to control infections in animals as well as in plants. And these are all theoretical or based on literature and these are not actually in the uh, practical classrooms. We looked at models to study phage interaction because if phages will be applied to uh, treat some infection, there will be some models that they can uh, use to be able to test the efficacy of these phages and how these phages can potentially be used to, uh, to treat uh, bacterial infections. So we looked at, for example, in vitro models, uh, we looked at the biofilms, we looked at the cell culture tissues, and then we look at in vivo models as well, looking at small animals, refined in vivo models, and also the various ways that these models can be applied to uh, study phage interactions. And then we looked at phage therapy applications in humans, and mainly Ben uh, looked uh, or presented these, and he looked at uh, compassionate use of phages and also clinical applications. And he is privileged to participate in all these uh, aspects of phage application, and he shared his experience with the participants in all these aspects. And each of us, the faculty members, are able to share our areas of phage research and to share or to present to the participants on all the various fields of phage research that we have privileged to carry. And then, because if, if the participants will eventually apply this work into uh, the phage research into their research fields, they will have to um, know how to apply for funding to be able to, su to support this project. So during the morning sessions, there were uh, lectures on how to apply for funding, uh, the different ways they can prepare for these, and also uh, the help that we, the, um, uh, the international bodies can help uh, uh, them to be able to apply for these fundings. And then when they eventually um, isolate their phages and they were able to characterize them, uh, we hope that they will be able to apply these phages uh, for uh, usage in their communities. So there is need for them to engage with the public, uh, the private sectors, the government, the health institutions, the educational institutions to be able to apply their research into practicalities. So we did some public engagement where they can learn how to do this. And also we introduced a review of literatures where we selected uh, top uh, and most recent uh, publications in phage research and we gave these to the students. And this is just to kind of expand their view and for them to know the various uh, uh, phage uh, research that is being carried out in different parts of the world and how to present uh, their data in a more um, public or in a more standard format. So these reviews of literatures really is an opportunity for them to engage in these particular fields. So the learning outcomes or the things that we hope at the end of the workshop, the, street, the participants will take home where they will be aware of natural roles of phages in the environment. 
and then to understand the mechanistic uh, view of how phages work. So this is very important for them to be able to apply this knowledge in phage research because without understanding how phages work, how phages interact with their bacterial host, then it will be difficult for them to be able to probe uh, problems uh, when they face them in, in the future in their phage research and also for them to engage and also know uh, the practicalities of working with phages. Uh, some phages are difficult to work with, others are easy to work with. So these are all the things that we have presented to them so they will be able to understand realities of applying phages, um, phage research in their personal um, pursuit. So um, I like this uh, slide that Martha put there is from Le Tizu and it says give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man how to fish and you will feed him for a lifetime. So as Toby mentioned from the slides that most of the uh, fish research has come from outside the areas where the uh, prediction of resistance and uh, difficulty of treating antibacterial uh, infections will come from. So if these researchers just send phages to these areas where there are difficulties, then they would just be treated for just one day, I would say. But then if these researchers are taught how to isolate phages from their environment, then they can be able to tackle this infection and treat it uh, in their own countries. So, um, I will just go through some of the objectives of the practical classes. I've already mentioned uh, all the various uh, topics that we have covered during the lectures or the morning uh, sessions. So these will mainly be um, the practical classes uh, that we have done. So the first objective is for them, uh, the participants, to isolate their own phages and to prepare clonal stocks because when you work with phage, you want to understand how individual phage react or how they interact with bacteria so you can be able to see how they can interact when you put them together in a cocktail. So they would need to isolate their own phages and then prepare clonal stocks of these phages and also prepare um, a high title stocks of these phages. And then also for them to determine how to uh, test phage efficacy. And this is to know the rate at which phages are able to kill the bacterial host. And also because uh, phages or phage infection involves different stages, we also walk them through experiments or assay that they can be able to determine the different um, aspects of phage infection, such as the absorption uh, uh, assays. So this is a time when the phage actually attached to the surface of the bacterium and then penetrates its DNA and eventually replicate and burst out releasing the progeny. But we, for them to really understand how these phages are able to absorb uh, on the surface of their bacteria. So we did that and then also conducted the one-step growth curve of bacteria. We worked out the birth size, we worked out the birth timing, and also the number of phages per cell that we are released. We also, this, this year in the uh, Tanzania workshop, we, we had the privilege to work with some mutant bacteria. Uh, these are mutants where the phage receptors have already been identified and also deleted. So we, uh, the phages that were isolated from the environment, we were able to test and see how these phages are able to selectively kill some uh, panel of bacteria. And that will guide us to know the uh, receptors of these particular phages. We also did live demo uh, of uh, sequencing of phage uh, genomes uh, during the workshop. So to isolate phages, the first thing is to um, know where to find the phages actually. And where you can find the phage depends on the type of phage that you are looking for. So for the various workshops, we focus on working with phages that target simple bacteria. And this is mainly for ease of work during the workshop. So we focus on Pseudomonas and uh, E. coli. 
So for us to isolate phages that target these bacteria, we now went to sampling sites, such as this uh, sewage sampling site. So it, it, these are areas where you can potentially find these bacteria and hopefully find phages that will infect them. So we went to um, the uh, sewage treatment plant and also uh, the students were, sorry, the participants were able to collect soil samples and also free running water in the streams. And uh, we, we, we now isolate phages from. So you can see the participants here around some sewage treatment plant collecting samples. You can see uh, someone here collecting some liquid and put it in a tube and that will be taken to the labs for them to isolate the phages from. So the first thing to do when you want to isolate phages, of course, is to um, carry on some assays. First is to see whether you can isolate the phages directly from the samples you have obtained. Now, where the situation where the phages are low in titers or you do not have um, a population of phage that target a particular strain of the pseudomonas that uh, we were targeting, it is important to enrich for the, bacteria, for the phage. So the first thing is to um, filter the samples, we centrifuge the, filter, the samples and then filter them and then collected the filtrates and spot them on a lawn of uh, bacteria. So the first thing they learned was to prepare a lawn. They need a confluence, beautiful confluence lawn of bacteria because if the lawn is not happy, obviously the phage will not infect effectively. So they prepared uh, the lawn of bacteria and then collected the filtrates that they obtained from the samples, including the sewage, the soil, and the water from the stream, and then spotted them on the lawns of the bacteria and then incubate. So the next day, they were able to see clearance on the plate and then carry on with the uh, purification steps. So for the enrichment procedures, as some of you might know, uh, we now targeted some bacterial hosts that are pretty promiscuous and allow phage uh, infection on them. So we added these cultures. We did single cultures as well as multiple cultures, and then added the samples that they have obtained from the environment and then enrich for 24 hours and up to 48 hours, depending on the timing that they were able to obtain clearance or phage indication from the loans. So as you can see from my screen, uh, students busy uh, spotting, uh, filtering, and this is Shauna here as well, um, collecting uh, agar plates and incubating them for the students, sorry for the participants. So, um, as I mentioned, we did enrichment procedures and we did direct isolation and we collected some data actually. And as you can see from my uh, screen here, the right hand side, we isolated for uh, isolated phages for E. coli and pseudomonas and we had direct isolation. So you can see these are the different groups uh, of participants and the samples that they obtain. If you can read my slide, you can see stream, you can see sewage, okay? Uh, so uh, for the E. coli, for the direct isolation, we did not um, see any uh, phage clearance. And that is not to say that the phages are not present, but because probably the limited um, host indicators that we use, uh, the phages uh, did not uh, show any clearance on this um, on this host. But then when we enriched for 24 hours, almost all the groups had phages. As you can see from 10 to the six of phages uh, infecting E. coli, uh, up to 10 to the nine of phages e infecting E. coli. Uh, for pseudomonas, they are quite high. We saw from 10 to the eight to about 10 to the 11 of uh, phages from 24 hours. So once we obtain this, we just abandon for the 48 hours because we have more than enough to work with for the workshop. And this is to say that these are not cl um, clonal phages. These are just phages with, which could be uh, multiple or diverse within these spotting areas, but are indicatory of um, infection 
on E. coli. So we saw that uh, enrichment gave us a better result. And this is good, but it has its own disadvantage because the enrichment was done on specific host. So that will limit the uh, number of phages that will infect uh, potentially the rest of uh, the host that we intend to screen. And then we also saw that the phages are really widely available in nature and they can um, really isolate them uh, from the environment. We also saw the best areas that you can um, screen uh, the, the, for phages. We saw higher results in sewage compared to the environment. So the students have learned that depending on the phage that you're targeting, that will guide the selection of the sampling area. And then we had we saw more of phages infecting E. coli than pseudomonas, although we have high titers of phages infecting pseudomonas compared to um, E. coli. So once they saw this clearance on the plate, the next thing to do is to purify these phages through several rounds of plaque purification. And this is where they will pick individual plaques from the plates and then um, carry on again with plaque assay or spot testing uh, to be able to purify this phage to make sure that the phage is clonal. That's just one phage that is present in the lysate. And the participant did this for E. coli as well as for uh, pseudomonas. You can see the picture of the students happy uh, to see Clarence on their plate. It's quite an exciting moment, actually. And all of us, <laughs> both the, um, the, the faculty members as well as the participants, really enjoy uh, seeing plaques coming up on the plates. So once uh, they've got this started, uh, they were to repeat this procedure several times uh, to make sure that the phages are clonal, as I've mentioned. Uh, so this we did this because from my experience, we know that some phages just like being together. <laughs> I will say uh, during my um, post, my first year of postdoc, I was given uh, some license of phages and I needed to purify them. And I had this sample of phage that just kept coming together. So you purify, you pick a single plug, you purify several times, but when you bulk up again, you find out that these phages still had the previous phage in the, in the other uh, initial sample. So sometimes you have helper phage, so phage do well in the presence of others. So we, we really need to uh, purify these phages uh, to make sure that they are, cl they are clonal. So they repeated these procedures, uh, as you can see uh, from the screen. Again, uh, the participants busy uh, picking plaques and purifying and continuing uh, with their plaque assays. So once they've done that and purify the plaques, the next thing to do is to prepare these stocks of purified phages in higher titer and also in a larger uh, volume. So uh, this was done by um, after several rounds of purification, say up to five times as, as time allowed us uh, during the workshop. Uh, the, the last stage was for them to scrape the surface. As you can see from this plate, uh, we can see, although, although you have a uh, sort of a confluence plaques here, uh, but then uh, you can see that the, 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 pla the plaques are uniform, they are the same. Uh, so when they were purifying, they were picking a single type of morphology of uh, plaques each time to make sure they are consistent with the fish they are carrying forward. So this is the final stage. And you really want to have a confluence loan like this, where the phage has maximized the presence of the bacterium, uh, killed it, but then sufficient to produce high titer. So with this kind of plate, uh, all they have to do was just to scrape the whole surface into a certain volume, say five mils, and then allow the, the volume, the, the uh, phage in the lysate or in, in the uh, SM buffer to uh, diffuse out after a while, say an hour in four degrees uh, centigrade, and then centrifuge, collect the lysate, and then uh, bulk up in liquid culture. So you can see Martha here guiding uh, the participants and how to select individual plaques uh, to maintain the morphology of the plaques. So they are um, maintaining that single uh, phage that they started to isolate. 
So it's quite an exciting moment and almost all the group had uh, phages, uh, more than one phage actually from each of the groups and they were able to purify the phage and some were even able to bulk up. So depending on how the phage uh, behaved. So um, after bulking up um, um, up to say 10 to the eight or 10 to the seven, uh, the participant had the opportunity to do um, a host range assay. And this is done by spot testing of uh, the lysate of the phage they obtained. And I also like to mention that um, in the uh, workshop, we brought some model phages that they started to work with, and this is for them to build confidence uh, on how to handle uh, phages before they began to isolate their own uh, phages. We also brought host, uh, bacterial host for the phages. So we incorporated them into the host range as well to see whether phages you isolate from Africa are able to infect uh, bacteria isolated from uh, UK or some other parts of the world. Uh, and then we also incorporated the uh, receptor mutants that we are kindly donated by Ben, one of the faculty uh, for the workshop. So as you can see, uh, these are some of the lysates uh, that they obtained, uh, P1, 2, 3, 13, 7. And also these are the isolates that they work with. It's just a snapshot of uh, the phage host range activity. So the red boxes shows areas where you do not have any uh, phage infection or killing. Uh, so the blue is where you have complete lysis. And then the yellow is where you have turbid lysis. And the, um, the, the blue kind of semi-turbid lysis as well. So um, we had turbid lysis and it's possible that the participants were isolate phages that are not completely virulent or they are not strictly lytic. And this is um, very uh, easy, especially where we had uh, the enrichment procedures, because it is possible that when the bacteria is stressed during the 24, 48 hours, uh, they will now shed off their prophages and these will eventually be released into the lysate and we had these uh, turbid clearance. Another reason could be the um, infection efficiency of the phage because different phages have different efficiency profiles on different uh, hosts. But this is just a snapshot of some of the host range activity that the participants had the privilege uh, to do. So as I've mentioned before, um, we looked at the different infective, infection uh, stages of the of, uh, phage and uh, we did the adsorption assays. And uh, this is a um, theoretical representation of um, phage uh, infection. So when the phage uh, infects bacteria, it goes through a latent period where it's now trying to establish uh, infection on the host and DNA is being released into the bacterial host. You start having um, phage uh, DNA replication at this stage uh, where you have the early enzymes, nucleic acid, the protein codes are being assembled. And then once this manufacturing uh, is completed, you begin to have burst. The phage begins to burst the bacteria and they are coming out. So this is the log phase, okay? Uh, where you have maturation, after maturation, the phage are released and the phage numbers begin to increase in the lysate and you have a time where you these plateaus and then you can even have a second phage but for this we stopped on the um the phage uh, adsorption and also we did the growth uh, curve of the phage so we took a model phage that we brought from the uk and we also use a model host that we also brought from the uk because we've already established the um the, the adsorption profiles and the infection profiles of this phage. So it's easy for them to follow rather than uh, using a completely new phage. So we also did um, the concept of MOY, and this is the ratio of phage to bacteria during infection. Uh, we did MOY of 10, but the participants also learned that there are different ratios that you can use uh, when you want to study phage uh, infection. So we did this and we were able to calculate uh, the um, 
the, the burst of the modal phage as well as the uh, burst time. So the student also worked, or the participants um, worked with um, the, as I've said, one step growth curve, um, and then they had the knowledge of the different uh, differences that the phages can have in their infection on different uh, hosts. So um, after this, it's important to see um, how the phages uh, can be applied. And one model that we used was the uh, biofilm. And I'm really excited to say that <laughs> among all the, um, uh, the different aspects of uh, the particles, the biofilm aspect seems to really be successful. And as you can see from here, we are able to establish biofilm for 24 hours and for 48 hours as well. And this is for pseudomonas. We took pseudomonas because pseudomonas are really good at forming biofilms. So this is a 24 hours biofilm uh, plate where this column of wells were treated with phage. And this column, as you can see here, is not treated with phage. But then this is the control, which is just the LB, although one seemed to be contaminated here. But as you can see, after 24 hours, you can see that this column of cells, actually the lysates are clear uh, compared to the bacteria alone. So uh, this is quite exciting because this, the participants were able to see that the phages do or can penetrate biofilm um, and clear it, or clear the, the, the bacteria uh, present. This is quite um, exciting and um, it shows the superiority of phage over antibiotics because we know antibiotics, of course, um, cannot uh, uh, penetrate biofilms. And, but from here, we can see that this has happened. And this actually uh, concurs nicely with um, uh, literature, as we can see. So we use the well method and we were able to do the CFU counts. We also did the staining with crystal violet and then measured the OD. Uh, with, with the different treatments. So you can see, of course, we had more biofilm in the 24 hours compared to the 48 hours. And then we saw that when you treat with phage, uh, you have less biofilm, whether single phage for these two phages, or when you combine them together, you have reduced biofilm compared to the control. And we saw the same reflection as well in the 48 hours. So after this, we uh, did the um, molecular work and for the Tanzanian workshop, we were able to do live uh, sequencing using the Minion. Uh, so this is a Slav here, one of the teaching assistants, and we can see the different participants uh, around him as he demos uh, this uh, sequencing um, work here. So this is the Minion, right? Very tiny uh, equipment. And this is him feeding the DNA. Uh, as you can see, this is a more uh, clearer picture here. And the, the, the Minion machine uh, is here. So the Minion was uh, connected to a laptop, as you can see, and we could see live as the sequencing data begin, uh, began to uh, be um, obtained. So we did that. Uh, the student isolated their DNA from the phage, um, and then we ran the mean ion. So, because uh, all the laboratory work, they are good, but with age and with modern technology, there is need to look into detail of the phage DNA. And so it was important for us to incorporate the molecular biology work as well as bioinformatics into the workshop. So uh, for example, if they're going to do PCR, how would they be able to uh, design their own primers? So this we did uh, during the uh, workshop. So this was me here during the Tanzanian uh, taking a class of bioinformatics. So we did primer design. We showed them how to do that manually in case they do not have um, uh, internet to run Primer 3. So we also try to use tools that are free 
for them. So Primer 3 is free as well. So for the bioinformatics, we're able to take a model genome from the internet and we were able to do gene calling using RAS, which is Rapid Annotation System Technology, uh, and also Artemis to uh, edit the genomes. Uh, we successfully did that during the uh, workshop. We also did some alignments and phylogenetic analysis using Mega7. So all of these are free and the students were able to download and run and did their annotations as well. So they were aware of relevant sequencing technology, the pros and cons of the different approaches, and then also how they can be able to use these uh, technologies to incorporate uh, into uh, their phage research. So one criteria for phage application in therapeutics is to have a phage that is devoid of unwanted genes, uh, such as the integrase. It has to be a typically uh, lytic phage. Uh, also some, uh, say, quorum sensing genes are uh, not expected to be found in the phage. So the only way for them to do this uh, is for them to use these tools to identify all of these in the genomes of the face. Some of the learning outcomes were for them to be aware of the rationale and the relevant software that they can use to design their primers and to know that the sequencing technologies are relevant uh, to the phage uh, research and also be aware of the tools that they can use to annotate their genomes and interpret uh, their data. So um, beside the actual workshop done on site in the different countries. One other aim is for us to establish collaborations with these participants. Um, and so analysis that they cannot do in their countries, we provide this connection and this platform to help them analyze or characterize these pages further. So um, this slide here shows the first phages that were isolated from the Ugandan workshop. So after they did their purification, which is not complete because of time limitations and some of the samples were difficult to work with and some of the phages as well were difficult to purify, we took their samples back to the UK and were able to uh, carry on with the isolation and purification steps. And then eventually we bought up these phages and use them to identify the morphologies. And these are, are some, because we've got about 30 of them from Uganda that were purified. So these are some that we have worked with. You can see UP2A is actually our model phage and has appeared on all our manuals since the beginning of the um, workshop. So the UP is Ugandan phage from sample two and is A, the first um, phage. And um, besides the TEM, we also did some killing assays. We did some host range activity. And I'll just show just one um, data. So this is one of the uh, killing assays that we did using single uh, phage where the phage uh, will begin to kill, but then eventually uh, resistance developing and you can see outgrowth. And this is the control of just the bacteria. And then this is the uh, control of just the LB, uh, LB broth. So we try to form a cocktail from these pages that we have isolated, but unfortunately we are yet to attain a successful cocktail that will reduce bacterial numbers consistently till the end of the uh, 24 hour time period uh, that we have. But just uh, to wrap up my session, this is just um, a summary. We have done quite a bit more than this, but just for time factor, uh, this is just a summary of what we have done uh, during the workshops. So I will hand over now to Toby as she continues uh, with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you so much. This was very informative. I'm actually going to continue, Ermi, and, and present a little bit more. Yeah, sure. If I made a to Thank wrap you, up. Yep, sorry about that. Um, 
Let's see, let me share my screen here now. And I wanna highlight that we've really appreciated having Janet on our team because she's been working in Martha's lab for a number of years now, but she's originally from Nigeria in West Africa. So she brings a particular perspective that we appreciate. And I think she enjoys bringing this technology back to her home continent. Um, so let me just wrap by, by telling you what we've learned and what um, the participants have gone on to do since the workshop, um, the various workshops. So this was the first workshop in Uganda. That's Janet teaching the group there. Uh, this was the entire group in Kenya for our second East Africa workshop. And then our third workshop was actually the first one in West Africa in Ghana. Um, so that's everyone there. And then finally, um, just six, seven months ago, we were in Tanzania for the third East Africa workshop. And let me highlight that the goals of these workshops were to not only learn phage biology and experimental techniques that Janet has outlined, but also a key important factor was to develop a network of phage researchers starting in a given region such as East Africa. But as Janet said, we also work to connect them to others and other resources in other parts of the world and other parts of Africa, Europe, America. And I put India there with a question mark because I actually think it could be valuable. I think many of the students in Africa would like to, I know some specifically who would like to come to India even for a few months to learn from working in your labs. So if anyone has interest in that, um, please feel free to contact me. We would love to hear about your interest in that. Um, so as part of that network development, the, the relationship development, this is from the first workshop in Uganda. This is the entire group spending a few hours together in the large sewage plant there, which is always a bonding experience. Um, I can just point out that this is Niamboro Moremi, who was the host of on the far left from Tanzania. She became the host of our uh, recent workshop in Tanzania. This is Atunga and Jelani, both from Kenya, who co-partnered and co-hosted our second workshop in um, East Africa, which was in Kenya. So we try to build upon and have former participants become the hosts since they know what to expect. Um, but we also did some dancing. Um, this is, uh, there's Jan, there's me with a funny African wig and Martha with one, um, and Atunga and Jelani. And I must say having social events like this during the workshop on an on a evening during the first week where we got to do some traditional African dancing and fool around, um, really changed the dynamics of the group uh, the next morning in the lab. I think that we've been able to build a network of people who enjoy working with each other. And I think that's an important part of what we're doing. Let me talk about the outcomes from these workshops. So what we do is at regular intervals after each workshop, we send a survey to the participants and ask things like, how many new phage projects have you started? How many institutions are you now teaching phage biology at? How many grant proposals have you submitted? And we start three months after the workshop because they start working remarkably fast. So after the Uganda workshop, there were five new projects teaching about phage biology was happening at four institutions and they had already submitted two grant proposals. Um, by the next year, we saw an amplification of those outcomes. And I think part of the reason is that many of the participants of the 2018 workshop had been taught by, or were starting to collaborate with participants of the 2017 workshop. So we were seeing this knowledge grow across the region. So they initiated within three months after the 2018 workshop, 16 projects were teaching at eight institutions and had submitted four grant proposals. Then we went to West Africa, Ghana for, for the next one. And actually because of funding, we only had 18 participants at this workshop instead of the 25 that had been at the previous two workshops. So they, given that there were a fewer number of participants, they were pretty much on par with their East African colleagues in terms of their activities within the first three months. But then something really happened in Tanzania and we see it really start to grow. And again, I think, whoops, 
I think many of the people who participated in the Tanzania workshop were already doing projects with people from the Uganda or Kenya workshops. And so here we started to see maybe they were already doing some projects. So now they came back from our workshop and said, oh, but I need to modify how I'm doing these research projects. And so we saw both new projects and modified projects and much more uh, teaching of phage biology and grant, grant proposals. So that's just three months after each workshop. But then we go on to um, poll the participants a year after the workshop, two years, now three years after the Uganda workshop. So if we look at what's happened just in the last three years with the 68 participants combined from three years ago, the Uganda workshop, two years ago, the Kenya workshop, and one year ago, the Ghana workshop, those 68 participants have already started more than 50 new phage research projects. They have taught phage biology to 1,100 African scientists. I was amazed at that. I'm so pleased. Um, and they've won grants totaling over to $925,000, which is remarkable. Um, this is better than we had hoped for. So it, it shows that this knowledge can be quickly transferred. Um, essentially, we train trainers who then go on and teach others. Let me end by saying where we're going with this. We do want to continue delivering more of these introductory workshops, the same as we've been doing. Hopefully once coronavirus is mostly behind us, we can continue in, to Southeast Asia and do our workshop there. Our next workshop in East Africa is planned in Rwanda, which is the, um, the only major country in East Africa um, where we have yet to really bring our workshop. West Africa is much larger geographically, more countries involved. So we're still deciding where the next workshop there might be. Um, but what we're starting to develop is an advanced workshop. So once people have isolated phages, characterize them and are now thinking, how do we develop this into a product, whether it's for agriculture or people, um, they, this advanced workshop would be targeting them where they could we would have experts talking about how do you formulate and manufacture phages at scale? How do you seek regulatory approval? Um, how do you develop financially sustainable business models and seek business partners? And how do you engage key stakeholders in, in the public regarding the use of future phage products? So one of the teams I'm working with is developing Campylobacter phages to decontaminate poultry meat in Kenya. So that team has met with almost 400 different poultry farmers and butchers to discuss what would it be like to use phages? What are their concerns? How might they want to receive the phage and deliver it to the chickens, that sort of thing. So I'm also pleased to report that just as of two days ago, I signed a grant, I received a grant from the Mozilla Foundation, signed the paperwork in partnership with Phage Directory, this will allow us to develop um, online training materials based on our in-person workshops. Um, during this time that we're stuck sheltering in place, we're gonna take this time to develop these materials. I think uh, Yan Zhang and um, Jessica Satcher from Phage Directory may be on this call and we're I have a meeting with them later this afternoon to start working on this project. So we're pretty excited about that. These learning materials will be freely available uh, to anyone in the world. We shoot for delivering that by December. And the learning materials will include lecture videos, lab, lab technique demo videos, the, a variation of the lab manual that we use in the workshop, a selection of experimental protocols, suggested research papers, and online discussion forums. So we're very excited that we'll, we now have the resources to do this um, as we've had to change our focus uh, during the coronavirus pandemic. So with that, I will end and thank you all for your time. And we're happy to take discussions, um, questions and have some discussion. So I turn it back to you, Ermi. Thank you. Thank you, Toby, so much. And uh, it was, not only you took us through the biology of the experiments, Janet, but Toby has told the uh, long-term effect of these short-term trainings, which is highly impactful. And we can see that the amplifying effect of your workshops, very impressive.
I must say. And uh, we have uh, in India, as you said, that we have several researchers who are doing excellent work for years. And uh, we, yeah, this expansion of sharing the expertise lying in few labs has to, should go out and train more number of people. Because as we can see that a lot of interest in phage is growing now, you know, with curiosity, interest, and people want to work. And, you know, even in my, uh, the questionnaire that we asked for registration, so several people asked that, how can we get trained? In fact, in mm -hmm. Professor Hatful's lecture also, there were several from different countries, they were wanting to learn. So what you're doing is really fantastic. Congratulations to you. And I've seen your work growing leaps and bounds in such a short time. And the amplifying effect is really impressive. The, once they learn and then they expand and do independently, I think your job is done. Um, how do they, how, I have just one question before I take audience question. Uh, how do they, uh, once you train them, so they have the support staff and infrastructure to maintain the stocks that they get out of the workshop to, uh, to keep them as stocks and, you know, we can, they can work on and further characterize them. So how do they maintain them when they start from scratch in your workshops? The phages that they isolate in your workshops. Maybe I'll let Janet take that question. What do you think? Yes, so the initial characterization is normally on a um, kind of um, a very small time that they have to do this. So, for example, the clonality, we, we cannot ensure that the phages are clonal because they would just manage to pass them through, say, two or three rounds of plaque purification. So that would mean that the phages will not be completely purified. So you can have a phage lysate that contains, so say, one or two phages in them. So at this stage, because of time limitation, they had to stop. Um, although we carry on with working with those phages in terms of horse range still as they are. But then we also have brought, like I've mentioned during my talk, brought some model phages that they can now see definitely how phages do work. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the uh, whole workshop, the team are able to carry on working with the phages they started to work with, you know, from the workshop or they can collect their own samples from the environment. So we have a WhatsApp group and we can see that just a few weeks after the workshop has finished, some of the participants are already out there in the environment collecting samples. And we even saw plates with them already beginning to isolate their own phages and we could see plaques on their plates. So, it's, it's interesting um, to see how they progress from there. But in terms of their samples, they do not just work with the phages they started to isolate during the workshop, but as well as collecting new samples and them okay. to work with. So for the samples that they begin to work with in the uh, workshop, as they disperse, it's possible for them to isolate different phages from the different samples that they have actually taken with them. And depending on the host, they expose the phage to. So it's, it's, it's diverse, I will say, uh, the phages that they will isolate uh, from the different um, samples. All right, thank you, Janet. So now I'll take a few questions, quite a few. In fact, I'm seeing that there are a lot of discussion going on vis-a-vis -vis several technical terms uh, in terms of PFUs and the per size uh, on mm. the live channel. So I'll take a few questions. First is, which bacteria strain did you use to isolate phages during your workshop? If you have not covered this. Shubham is asking this question. Which bacteria strain do you use to isolate? So I think you were using Pseudomonas. And E. coli. And E. coli, and e. coli mm -hmm. right. Yeah, Main, mainly, because, mainly because they are easy to work with and their phages are really easy to isolate as well. You can basically isolate E. coli from almost everywhere, basically, yeah. and, and, and Pseudomonas as well. We don't wanna, for example, I, I have done a lot of work on Clostridium difficile, but it's not possible to do this work in places because we would need an aerobic chamber, we would need quite a lot of you know, media for them to work with. So we want to work with something that is easy, something that they can easily handle. And as well as something um, they can easily extrapolate into their own work. So 
we, we just focus on these two E. coli and pseudomonas. Okay. I would add to that, I'm looking at the results of the workshop polls that I talked about two, three, and, and one year after the first three workshops. And the participants are now working on 23 different types of bacteria. E. coli and pseudomonas are some of the most common ones, but they're also working on Klebsiella, Staphylococcus, um, uh, um, Salmonella, Proteus, Campylobacter, cholera. So, so they're going out and, and working on many different types of bacteria. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, the next question is from Taruna Anand. She wants to ask, what do you do when the enrichment doesn't work in your procedure? So let's say some specific pathogens or strains, which probably are not, uh, they lose out on enrichment. So what procedure do you follow to get those phages? Um, so for the enrichment, we've been lucky actually to have at least a group to isolate phage from the enrichment. And from the direct isolation, we've got uh, some isolate, isolates from the first few uh, workshops. For example, the Uganda, we had some from the direct isolation, the Kenyan as well. Uh, but for the Tanzanian, I think it's all about the environment as well. Um, we, we weren't able to isolate directly from the samples, but we got a lot from the um, enrichment. We had to abandon the 48 hours because we had so much even okay. within the 24 hours. So uh, yeah. And then for the groups that are not able to uh, isolate, we can share from the group that we're able to isolate something so they can work with. And in addition to that, we brought model phages. So for example, the growth curve, the absorption assays, the biofilm, the DNA extractions, all you know, were with the phages that we brought because we can definitely know, because we know the characteristics of these phages. Right. So they're more standardized already. So there's one student from Antwerp in Belgium, and he's in the student, uh, PhD student at the Institute of Tropical Medicine. His name is Jolene Lomin, if I pronounce correctly. He wants to know if similar program like yours is running in Europe, in, in any European country for European macrophages. I don't know if Belgium is a, is a good center for a lot of research and training. Yeah. So I don't know if they run some of their own programs. I do know in Colombia and South America, there's at least one group running workshops, mm -hmm. uh, sort of like ours. Uh, they're a little more advanced. I think there was one in Portugal. Um, those are the ones I'm aware of. Are you aware of any others, Janet? No, I, I don't think, yeah. Just beside the ones you've mentioned. Yeah. And I'll say we get asked to bring ours elsewhere. And we're going to stay focused on our mission and stay in Africa, Africa. and Asia. Yeah, but we're ha more than happy to make our teaching materials available for others to use. So, sure. so this question is from Atif Khan. He wants to know that he has also done some experiments uh, where he isolated phages from river water by enrichment procedures. And he got a good number of plaques. But then they, once he reinfected them uh, using the same host, uh, he could not uh, get those phages back. So do you get the similar problem or uh, is there some problem in the procedure? Uh, the question is once you get phages, but when you yeah. reinfect, you don't get them. So, yeah. yeah, it's possible to, to get that happening. Why? For so many reasons. One, if the phages are not stable, it is hard to uh, have them in pure um, lysate. So there is a, a guy working in our lab uh, two years back and he had these uh, phages that um, once he prepares a lysate and the lysates are like 10 to the eight, 10 to the nine, after a few days, you get like 10 to the two or basically he struggles to get a plaque out of it. So some phages are naturally not stable uh, on their own um, in the lysate. So he had to maintain them because they are also temperate phages. He had to maintain them in lysogenized form. And then he now lysed the, the, the bacteria to get them. So that is one. And then two, um, sometimes during phage purification, we use um, things like um, chloroform to remove the smell of the sea wage or mm -hmm. to lyse the bacteria. 
sometimes some phages do react to some of these things and um, forward in purifying them, you tend to lose them because they react to these chemicals and uh, they become non-viable. And also even PEG, so that's polyethylene glycol, uh, mm. when you treat it with phage as well, they tend to react to the uh, PEG to eject their DNA. And once the DNA are uh, ejected, then the phage will not be infectious. And when you do plaque, you might see them on the TEM, but then you will not have any infection happening. And then um, you have clearance based on lysis from without. So this is not as a result of true infection where you have a phage penetrating a bacterium, releasing DNA, replicating and bursting. No, you have a lysis from external. And this happens when you have a high tighter phage. Many phages will now be attracted to one single bacterial cell. And then they compete by poking holes through this, uh, this host. So the phage eventually compromise the cell wall of the bacteria causing lysis. But then when you have this lysis, the plaque and you check, you will not find any phage in. So this is not, the killing is not as a result of true infection from within, but it's actually um, killing from without. So there is that concept. Uh, the person might have to do a bit of reading uh, to mm -hmm. understand all these different factors that play key role um, in, in phage isolation. I am a victim actually during my PhD, I've tried to isolate phages for CD from stool samples and I wasn't able, I will have the face plaque will appear, but then the phage from the plaque are not infectious. So when I checked the slices from the TEM, I could see broken heads, broken tails, but no true complete phage. So these slices that I was seeing might be coming from lysis from without. So it's wow. possible for all these things. Yeah, maybe high title of ages lies from without. Okay. So there are two more. I'll club now question because there are several of them. So Atik Khan and uh, Varun Bavara has two. Both of them have same question, similar question for to Janet, and they want to know that when you were doing biofilm experiments, so uh, do you see the effect of ages, uh, the inhibitory effect of ages on biofilm formation, or the disruptive? effect of phages on, that means once the biofilm has formed, and then you add the phages to disrupt it, or do you add it along with the bacterial host so that to see whether the film forms or doesn't form? So, okay. so for, for this particular expert, although I'm happy to talk about biofilm as well, because uh, it's, it's part of my uh, area, mm -hmm. um, but then for this particular workshop, we established the biofilm first. So the biofilms were established for 24 hours and also for 48 hours. And then the supernatant, and the planktonic cells were washed off and then treated with phage. So we were only focusing on the biofilms that were already formed. And then we were able to analyze the effect of phage treatment using the CFU counts and also the crystal violet stain. For this particular experiment, it is not uh, possible for us to uh, determine whether the phages actually disrupt the biofilm, okay? Although we saw the killing, so it's possible that they have disrupted the biofilm and this is an assumption, but we do not have the facility to be able to assess that. But from my experience, I have worked with CD phages and I have used TEM analysis, sorry, uh, SEM, scanning electron mm -hmm. microscopy, to mm -hmm. see the progression of a uh, biofilm formation. And then when I added phage, I was able to monitor daily how these biofilms were being disrupted. And you can see from the pictures that the biofilms are actually uh, disrupted. And I would say for my phage, they do not really do a good job at killing the bacteria but they do a very good job by disrupting the biofilm and so giving advantage for antibiotic to work more efficiently. So um, this work is published. So if you want to have a look at it, you can just Google my name, Nale, I think it's 2016, in Frontiers mm -hmm. in Microbiology, and you will see all this data. But from this work, from the workshop, we did not have access to SEM uh, <laughs> facility. Mm -hmm. 
So it was yeah. mainly for the COP counts and um, crystal violet stain. Wonderful. So you can, I think you can refer to her paper and get more details. Pragya Mishra wants to know what's the density of phages usually you found in sewage water when you isolate phages? How many phages do you get, let's say, per per in the? So, per yeah, month? this is quite interesting because it depends on the area, actually. Yeah. Um, I remember in, um, I think it was in Ghana that we sampled from the hospital. No, it was in Kenya. Mm -hmm. that was right. From the hospital, yes. And for some of the samples, we had 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 of phages directly from the environment. So wow. these are just sewage from different wards. And we just filtered them, centrifuge and filtered. And then we just tightened. For some, we had 10 to the 9 mm -hmm. or 10 to the 8. But as I've said, this might not be one phage, 10 to the 9. It might be several phages in there infecting that same host and contributing to form this uh, PFU count. Yeah. So uh, it depends on, on, on the phage. And I would yeah. also add, it depends on the bacteria and the source. So mm -hmm. one of the things that we try to do if we can is get access to the different stages in a sewage plant. Mm -hmm. And then the, the participants get a chance to see, oh, this particular stage in the sewage plant where you would expect a higher concentration of bacteria you had a better chance of isolating phages. So it's re um, Ben gives a lecture on choosing your sampling site based on your bacteria and what you can expect. Yeah, and I'd like to say that uh, for the first two workshops, that was the one in Uganda and the one in uh, Kenya, we tried to isolate bacteria from the environment mm -hmm. to enable us to have a good uh, phage isolation procedure. But because of the amount of work that is needed you know, to be done by the students yeah. we have to regulate and just remove that aspect. But mm -hmm. for the Uganda, we were able to isolate bacteria that effectively just allow uh, proliferation of these phages on them. So it's, it's really interesting what we saw. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so next question is from Slati Botfast, if I can again pronounce it correctly. His question is that phages that are difficult to isolate from each other are always isolated together because do they have any synergy or I mean, why are you not able, I didn't get the question very well, but so I'm reading it as it is. Phages that are difficult to isolate from each other are always isolated together because they have a synergy interaction is the question. Synergy as in, um, do they, maybe coexist, or I don't know, like how can yes. I do this? Um, yeah, so you, we need to be a bit careful here uh, because what you see might probably uh, be regulated by a lot of factors. Um, so when I mention about the uh, CD1, we know that 99.99, in fact, all the strains of CD that have been known till date do encode prophages in their genomes. So during phage propagation, sometimes you have the host stressed and they do shed their own phage as well. So the phage kind of continue to you know, be released even in the lysate. It's very, very common with pseudomonas as well. So you have this phage consistently in all the lysate, though you're propagating 10 different phages. So that is to say that the phage within the host are actually shed during this uh, isolation. But sometimes you have this synergy with two phages um, that to be honest, I can't explain precisely mm -hmm. how they work, but I have had this difficult lysate as well that I've worked with. I have used primers, I've designed primers specific for each phage and also for the prophage present in the host. And I have used this PCR to select a particular plaque that I will carry forward. But by the time I bulk up and you test, you will find that other phage in there. So, but I, I really don't know the mechanism to be honest. <laughs> yeah, no problem, yeah. And uh, Nisha Rathor wants to ask, so what, are the, what are some of the virulence assay to characterize phages? Virulence assay. Yeah, so there are many uh, things that you can do um, and the virulence you can test either in pure culture and you can also test in different um, 
in vitro models uh, for you to see how the phages interact with other things to clear the bacteria. So they are all uh, virulence assays. And then you can also use different MOIs, and that is the ratio of phage to bacteria, and see how um, the phages do kill uh, the bacteria with low numbers or with high numbers, and also whether with single phage or double phage, whether they you know, help to um, complement uh, each other in the killing. So, but for this workshop, we mainly focus on just spot testing. Um, for the first workshop, we tried to do killing in liquid, but then it was just too much for the participants, mm -hmm. which we have to remove in the next um, workshop in Kenya. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, a few more questions. Gokul Nair wants to ask, what's the best way to store phages for a long time, for mm -hmm. a long period, in order to get better revival later for phage infection? And um, so this is dependent on the phage. So for all the phages that we work with in our lab, for my phages, and there are about hundreds of them, I was able to maintain them in minus 80 Mm -hmm. at 25% uh, glycerol. Okay. So you, pro yeah, you produce a high titer of the phage and prepare a sterile 50% glycerol and you mix 50-50 and that will give you a final concentration of 25% glycerol. You mm -hmm. only coat them and then put them in the freezer. After a while, take out a vial and then you titer. I have a phage, I have a set of phages that are about seven years old in minus 80, and I have not yet lost a log of them. So we maintain them in that um, way. But it's, it's, it's variable. I would say it depends on uh, the type of phage. There was a paper that was published, I think, 2018, and it mm -hmm. talked about protocols of uh, storing phages long term. So mm -hmm. you can do that in various ways. Another way is actually to encapsulate the phage or formulate them in some pH stabilizing agents or some temperature stabilizing agent. You can spray dry them in powder form, uh, which you can store, prob I would say indefinitely in that particular form, in a particular temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, you can purify them by cesium chloride and put them in 25% um, glycerol. Um, or even like the student I mentioned, he had to maintain his culture in lysogenic form. So mm -hmm. you can't just leave the phage in lysate, they just completely die. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think it depends on the phage. You mm -hmm. have to check the stability of your phage at different conditions mm -hmm. and then try to optimize what is best for your sample and stick to it. One thing you must have is to have a seed stock when you produce your phage, you should have a seed stock which you can reserve because once you lost that, mm, RIP, it could be that you lost that phage mm -hmm. and you might not be able to get it again. So have a yeah. seed stock where you can always go back and have it recovered. Yeah. And I would emphasize two yeah. things there. One is the key, as, as Janet said, of adding the glycerol, which if you freeze at minus 80, otherwise you lose a lot of phages. Um, and then for our Campylobacter phage product project for poultry, we have dry powder formulated phages and they're stable now for up to two years at room temperature. So that's another, as Janet mentioned, possibility. You mean lyophilization? No, dry powder formulation is a different materials okay. engineering approach than lyophilization. Um, and we work with a specialist who does that and it's been great. Okay, great. Okay, so it's just a just few more questions. Now I'm skipping multiple questions from one person. Maybe Janet is very generous, so maybe she can write them back to I can send those questions. So uh, I will pick one question for one person because there's so many more. And that speaks volumes about the interest that you've generated. It looks like you've held a workshop here itself. <laughs> So Gokul Nair has asked the question. Now, Biswajit also just a follow-up question to the, what you were saying, that it does, does cesium chloride gradient centrifugation suits every phage? I mean, do you think a variability in that also, that some are might be, some might be a little uh, sensitive to cesium chloride gradient centrifugation? I think this is what he wants to ask. You're talking about cesium chloride density, right? Yeah, it's possible for some phages to be sensitive. Now, 
again, it depends. You have to know your fate. You have to know, you know, what you're working with. Something might work for me, but not work for somebody else's phage. So some phages are sensitive to cesium chloride, but I think most phages do well in cesium chloride. Mm -hmm. If your phage doesn't do well in cesium chloride, you can try sucrose. So mm -hmm. sucrose density gradient as well does very, very good. And then even for the cesium chloride, one problem with cesium chloride is actually the layering. So mm -hmm. people don't get um, good purification because they didn't layer the cesium chloride, you know, very well. It's very tricky for you to layer the different densities. So there is a new protocol that you can actually use. I've tried it. It works perfectly well, especially if you're in a rush like me all the time in the lab. Mm -hmm. You just shuffle your cesium chloride, shuffle your phage, and centrifuge at a very high speed for about three hours. And then you get your pellet, which you can then start phone out with the syringe and then purify, you know. So, but if your phage is not good with a cesium chloride, you can try uh, sucrose. And then another method is PEG. You can purify your phage using that as well, or concentrate it using PEG. Uh, again, if it is sensitive to PEG, then you have to try some. You can just centrifuge mm -hmm. at uh, say 150,000 uh, RPM for eight hours, you would definitely get, you know, a layering of the phage, not a pellet, but you will get a layering at the bottom of the, um, of, of the centrifuge, which you mm -hmm. can take out the supernatant or the top phase and then um, use the bottom phase. All right. Uh, Joseph Campbell, he has a question. He asks, how different were the phages isolated from different countries? Did you profile them? Uh, yes. So, mm -hmm. um, so far, I have worked extensively with phages from Uganda and from Kenya. And also some of the samples, because for my personal use, I've always been focusing on Pseudomonas and E. coli. But from our lab, we've had people isolate phages for different bacteria from the same sample. So mm -hmm. for example, we have um, someone isolated phages for I think Vibrio or something like that, you know? Uh, so th they're, they're quite variable. And because we just mainly target pseudomonas is just what we get. <laughs> it doesn't mean there are no other phages that are present in it. So mm -hmm. yes. Um, we, we have essentially, we've done TEM for these two samples from Uganda and from Kenya. We've done, actually for the Uganda, they're the ones that we have uh, done very, very much work with. We've sequenced seven of them. Uh, mm -hmm. We know their genomes and uh, we've written down some few things, but I think logistically <laughs> we didn't get it and out of the to, to answer Joe's question, um, uh, we do know that several of those that have been sequenced, which actually were sequenced in Tanzania, um, which were brought, they were phages that were isolated also in Uganda. We know that several of those were novel, um, which is pretty exciting. We, mm -hmm. uh, for such a relatively no number, low number of phages that we've sequenced thus far. Okay. Uh, Nakiaga Vini. He's asking, is there any, uh, he or she, I don't know, is there any country in Africa where phages have been used as biocontrols mm. for plants or animal infections? So I'm working with um, two different teams in Kenya that are developing Campylobacter and then another team developing Salmonella phages for poultry. Those are sort of the farthest along projects that I'm aware of. So they may be some of the first ones that will be approved for use. There's also a team, a uh, combined team with Ga between Uganda and Ghana that won an $800,000 grant from uh, the African Union and the EU to develop phages for aquaculture, specifically for tilapia fish. They're pretty far along too. So those may be some of the earliest ones approved. Mm -hmm. Those are the farthest ones along that I know. And then many individual labs working on different phages. Yeah. But nothing officially approved. Right. Dr. Indian Kandasamy wants to ask how to prepare phage samples for good TEM images. And this question is asked mm -hmm. by several people. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. Aditi Singh is also asking the same question. 
and I think one more person I missed the name, but three questions are there on sample preparation for good stem image and would like to see a full fade with head, tail and base plate. The problem is we get often black heads or poor tails. So how do we prepare samples mm -hmm. so that we are able to see all three uh, structures very well? So um, one thing that gives poor image of TM is the medium. So if you use a medium that is really rich in protein and you have molecules all over the place, you would have all this superimposing on phage, superimposing on other things. Um, and that could potentially just give you an image that is not really very nice. Uh, sometimes also the way you handle the phage, if there's a lot of uh, high speed centrifugation, you can have broken tails, broken heads all over the place. And then you have TEM that is not um, a very good. Uh, one thing you can do one, and also another thing is um, to be able to have a phage in a limited area so you can zoom in. Because if you have a phage that are spread far apart, it's you know, difficult to really have an overview of the phage. So you want to concentrate the phage. You want to have a very nice, high, tighter phage for you to work with. That's the first thing. And then two, if you don't have the high, tighter phage, you can concentrate the phage by using the different methods I've mentioned. For example, um, the um, PEC, you know, you can do that. And then you can purify the phage, again, removing debris and some ghost phage by using the um, cesium chloride or sucrose uh, gradient to remove that all the artifacts and all the broken things. Um, but finally, if you really want to get a good um, picture, you might want to pass your phage lysate through ammonium acetate. So mm -hmm. ammonium acetate is a high, uh, you use about seven molar ammonium acetate, that's high molar seven, uh, ammonium acetate. And then you add your phage lysate and centrifuge, I think it's about uh, say 21,000 G for about say 10 minutes. And you keep doing this through about three or four rounds. Mm -hmm. So you will not get a pellet, but you will get a condensation. So you will get um, a gradient of the phage at the bottom of the tube, which you can keep purifying with the ammonium acetate. And once that is complete, you can now uh, check your phage in under the TEM. But the most important thing is actually the lysate, the, the medium that you use uh, to produce the phage. Okay, would you recommend any paper for referring uh, if what has to follow? What you just um, explained? I, I can, I've, I've done this in several of my papers and you can mm -hmm. have a look, you can oh. Google my name, you can Google Martha's name as well because she's done lots of projects where TMs have been done. Um, so you, you, I think you can have a look. Okay. So the last question, there are several questions which are about phage therapy, horizontal gene transfer, uh, synergistic use of antibiotics with phages. I think uh, in interest of time, I would request uh, if it is possible for uh, both of you or anyone of you to reply to these questions, I can send you. But uh, mm -hmm. I am right now confining questions uh, directly to your workshop and which are more procedure based for phage researchers. Uh, so the last question, uh, if I got it right, this is from Fatma, and she's asking how to design primers for the whole phage. Uh, I think what she's trying to ask is, uh, are there primers for screening plaques? Um, how to design a primer for the whole phage to test the plaque? Uh, the plaque is very large in size, so I'm sorry, maybe... Uh, yeah, I mean, in general, maybe you can tell how if you use primers, yeah. let's say for screening plaques and identify if they are different from each other. Is there something like that? Yeah. So I think um, you, it would be hard for you to um, design a primer to amplify the whole phage. Let's say your phage is 50 kb. How difficult yeah. it will be for you to amplify 50 kb. I mean, it's not going to be like a routine PCR at all. So you want something that is routine. So you have to bear in mind, you need an amplicon that will be easy for you to amplify. 
So mm -hmm. say 200, 250 or 300, 500, maximum say 750 base pairs. So th that would be like a routine PCR where you can just use just normal polymerase to amplify. So it would be good to target an amplicon that would give you that size. So for example, you're going to screen say 100 plaques that you have obtained and you want to know whether the plaques is this page or that page. Mm -hmm. Then doing 50 KB is going to be something that you're going to spend the rest of your PhD probably trying yeah. to do for these same plaques. So yeah. um, for that, again, use a small amplicon. Now to do this, you will have to target one gene that is probably unique for this page. So if you have say five pages, what I would do first of all is to align these pages and mm -hmm. see how different they are and then look at which section they are different. Okay, so you might see probably 50% differences in the integrase or differences in the uh, repressor gene or maybe 50% difference in the um, capsid gene. You can just take that capsid gene and then design primers within the capsid and then take region that is, um, so again, for the primer design depends on whether you're, you're, you're uh, designing primers for that single phage or you want something to cover a wide range. Say if you're doing just myoviruses or just viruses, you want something to capture virus, capture myovirus, capture podovirus, that you can do as well. But if you're doing for one phage, you can take those phages, align them, see where they are different, pick that gene, and then take that region that you can amplify. Once you have done that, you have to test your primers to see it is not amplifying something else. So it should be negative for other phages that you're dealing with and positive for just that phage. And you don't want to be on the lab, uh, sorry, in the lab doing this. You can do this. Um, online, in silico, you can do this. So once you have the genome of the phages, you can just upload them on, uh, say, uh, in silico PCR. There are so many platforms that you can test that. And then you put your primers in the forward and the reverse, and then you amplify, and then you can see the, the, the amplicon. So um, one, yes, you can do that for individual phages, but probably not amplifying the whole of the phage, take a gene, look at the difference, pick a region that is specific for that phage, specific for that gene, and then you can now use that to differentiate between the, the, the genes. But even when you have a phage plaque that is positive, you still need to purify that plaque again because that plaque might have something else. Some labs do up to 10 times plaque purification to make sure it is clonal. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, you have to do this. Some, some labs don't do that. They take a sample from the environment and enrich it for a particular strain. They get the, fi the filtrate and that is what they use for their phage. So I think each, each lab do things differently. But if you want clonal phage, you have to have something workable with an amplicon that is easy for you to work with. Great, thanks so much. Isn't it fascinating? I mean, it's 10 p.m. in India and the questions, <laughs> their people are so, you kept them really enthralled by your questions. So I'm so thankful to you. And now I would like to wrap the session. And may I please ask Professor Gopalnath, who is the secretary of SBRT to extend a word of thanks. And uh, before he thanks, uh, I have to also thank very much. It has been exciting and very informative, highly informative. And as Toby had this apprehension that this is evening time and weekend, and we look at the interest uh, researchers have. So phages are, and the people who are doing these workshops are doing really fantastic work. Hats off to you both, <laughs> I must say. Mm. So Professor Gopalnath, are you there to um, wrap the session and extend your word of thanks? Are you there? Can I? Um, Professor Gopalnath is the secretary. You may, you all would have received letters from him, and he is uh, I don't know where is he. So yeah, if he, yeah. am, am I oh, wonderful. Yeah. Please, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Just uh, wonderful. Two words are sufficient, and Dr. Toby, you have already done the job. But I am so grateful to Dr. Toby and Dr. Janet to took out us from the world of Corona to world of bacteria. <laughs> 
the whole session was so nice and it, it is first uh, work on this uh, webinar uh, under the banner of the SBRT. And uh, I would like to inform the two speakers. Thing and we are trying to have the network in India, but your effort to make it global network will be the will be happy and love to be the part of the global network. Yes. And uh, another thing I would like to request you, if you are planning some workshop in India also, we'll be very happy. And the other thing is that we would like to have the advanced workshop because we are also using the, these bacteriophages in uh, clinical practice, especially the ethical committees are permitting for the local use. We have used in the chronic infections, non-healing ulcers, and also in the acute infections, sometimes maybe more than seven days. So uh, that is very important for us. So again, uh, to not to say so, so much, but the thing that the, it was really uh, very exciting for all of us. And uh, again, I would uh, thank to Dr. Urmi also, to the whole team of SBRT, Dr. Um, uh, all, all this team of, yeah, Tarna Anand. So uh, uh, I think this effort and this type of webinar will keep on doing under the banner of SBRT. And we should also be the part of the global network of the bacteriophage research. And uh, with these words, I thank you again, all, all of you. Thank you very much. Well, we appreciate your... Um your attention, as you said, late on a Friday night before your Independence Day, and we wish you a good holiday. And please don't hesitate to email any of us, the, any of the instruction staff. We're happy to answer specific questions or um, logistical questions about the workshops. And we will announce through SBRT and other platforms when the online teaching materials come available in the next few months. Great, so thank you very much. Uh, I thank uh, all the SBRT members. Uh, Dr. Ramesh is here, Professor Sanjay Chipper, Professor Gopalnath and Taruna, and of course to the students from my lab, Ritu, Ritam and Saroj. So Ritu you met and Saroj and um, Ritam were managing the YouTube and they were sending me questions, which I was reading very comfortably. So I thank them all <laughs> also very much. <laughs> so it's a very collective effort and I'm, Thank you once again very much, Toby. Good to see you and very nice to meet you, Janet, also for the first time. I mean, Toby, I've met once, but Janet never. So he, she's so patient in teaching. And thank you so much for your time. And with such patience, you explain each and every, you answered every question so well. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, may I take the liberty, Toby, to forward some of the questions which are still unanswered yeah. because there were too many. So I chose not to, at least I took one question per person. But if you have time, I'd be very happy to send them your way. Yeah, happy to do so. All right. So thank you very much and have a good day. Uh, and a good word, night. Last word, I would like to tell that Dr. Taruna and Dr. Urmi are the pillars of our association in India. They are doing great job. Thanks to them again. Oh, mm. not, at all. not at all. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, welcome. You're welcome. Okay, so bye-bye. Alrighty, good to be bye. with you. Take bye. care. Take care, bye-bye.